Well, good morning, real life. It's good to see slash hear some of you. Uh, my name is Josh Gray. I get the privilege of being the lead servant at this great church called Real Life on the Palouse, um, where our vision is to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. And our mission, the way that we do that is we make biblical disciples in relational environments. And I have some really cool news for you that I understand that we have up to three people that are going to be getting baptized after the second service today, making uh, decisions for Christ. So, hey, maybe you didn't even know that maybe uh, it's your day today, too. And so uh, I also want to welcome all of those folks uh, joining us online. Thanks for being part of our online family. We love you. Uh, This series here, we have a four-week series uh, up to our Christmas Eve day series. So just so you guys know, uh, our Christmas Eve service will be our normal Sunday services at uh, at our normal times uh, on Christmas Eve day. Um, So we have four weeks as we move towards this Advent series. And I want to kind of lay out the structure uh, of this series. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about kind of like, where is this king now? How do we find him? Uh, Next week, it'll be about seeing God well and knowing that he also sees you. Week after that, we're going to talk about the gifts. What kind of gifts would you give to a king? And maybe what kind of gifts has he given to you? And then uh, after that, we're going to, uh, our Christmas Eve day service is going to end with worthy worship and how do we worship this king well. In Matthew 13, there's this uh, small parable. It says, the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and he bought that field. Again, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for, a fine, or for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything and he bought and uh, he had and he bought it. And as we connect the series that we just exited called King Me to this Advent series, um, when you think about these kings and the, the reign that happened as we are anticipating the arrival of King Jesus, we have 42 kings through two different kingdoms. And from Saul to King Jesus, we have a thousand years. We have a thousand years where we said, hey, give us this earthly king. We want a king so we can be like these other nations. But the give us an earthly king idea didn't work. And it still doesn't work, even though we may find areas in our life where we're trying to put the king, not King Jesus, but a different king in our way. We're here at this highly anticipated time of Advent Advent means the arrival of someone important or something important or noble, something noble. And so as we look forward to this Advent season, what are you looking forward to? What are you anticipating? Are you anticipating this? Are you anticipating a baby in a manger? You know, from our last series from the book of Judges, on, we saw people caught in this cycle of trying to fill a need with the wrong things. And I wonder if that hits anybody in here. Is there any need that you think you might be trying to fill with the wrong things? The text talks about that people did evil in the eyes of the Lord or they did what was right in their own eyes. And often mankind thinks, man, We have figured this out. We finally, like our generation gets it, right? Not the other generations, but our generation understands this. We've got it figured out. We're obviously smarter than everybody else that came before us. But what generation has not succumbed to what Saul, King Saul did? What generation has not succumbed to what David went through? What generation has not succumbed to the the riches of Solomon? You see, the kings got caught up in some different things. And one of the things that the kings got caught up in was they substituted the gift of God for the gift of of power. And they want to have this power, this power, this might, this rule, this authority, this presence over top of someone else. And I wonder 
in my life, I have to evaluate where, where am I trying to place power? Where am I trying to place my power over God's power? What, what kind of manipulation am I putting out there that I may not even be aware of because I've been doing it for so long? And so what power is getting in the way of you seeking King Jesus? Well, then you have David, and he gets caught up in this sin, this sin that ended up in him having sex with Bathsheba. And that was his downfall. And so it's not just sex, the physical act of it, but it's relationships, it's vanity, it's what do I look like, it's all of these things that get in the way. It's the the worship of me. And I wonder in my own life, where have I made that my king? Where have I allowed this to get engaged in my life and mess me up? And then we get to Solomon. And Solomon was so wise, he asked for wisdom. And then we talk about the wealth of Solomon. And where am I putting money as my king? Where does that come from? Am I more concerned about my resources and my stuff? Or am I more concerned about what God has in his purpose and his plan? See, these are the kinds of gifts that the world says that you need. You need more of all of these things according to the world. You need more power because with power comes control. And when you have control, you get to make your own plan. You get to do it your way. You need more money because whatever you have is not enough. Because we're all wanting here, I can tell. We need more relationships. You can't just have one partner. Why would you just have one? There's so many people out there. And we throw things away that God intended for great good None of these things are bad in of themselves, but they're not what this king that we're anticipating is bringing us. See, this king says something like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for, the kingdom of, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meekness is power under restraint. It's restrained power. You could, but you didn't. You have the right to, but you didn't exercise your right. You chose to do the responsible thing. Blessed are those who hunger for hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the people who want to live rightly, who want to obey God and serve and see others. Blessed are the righteous. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Not the gossipers, not the people who stir, stir up distension and start stuff and make things like just try and create chaos. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because they're living rightly, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, God kept sending these kings to help his people return to the one true source of life and peace. God wanted and wants a different kind of people. But Israel, as we learned in Kings, they wanted to be just like all the other nations. And Saul helped them become all, just like all the other nations. David tried to turn the hearts of people after God, but he too succumbed to the allure of power, sex, and money. Solomon was given this wisdom. He was so wise that he squandered all of his gifts. Collecting more women, more money, more fame, and more power. And what did that lead him to? Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Obey God is what Adam shared last week. You see, God made a promise. He made a covenant with Abraham 2,000 years even before the birth of Jesus. He made a promise with David almost 1,000 years uh, before that 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 this king that we're really needing would come through his lineage, a king who would choose God, who would show us how to live the way our creator intends. And that's the king that we're anticipating right now in this season. Hopefully not even in this season, hopefully in your entire life. A king who wouldn't choose power or sex or money. When you start looking at all the different religions of the world and their leaders, what did those leaders get that Jesus didn't get? Power, sex, and money. Study them. 
<coughs> See, this was God's unconditional promise. Not based on God's people behaving perfectly, but that God's love would never depart. This is the king we are anticipating. Is this the king that you're anticipating? As a result, human history will be changed forever. And here's a king who could lead people out of the continual spiral of the sin cycle that happened over and over again into a redemption cycle to be redeemed. A king who has an unlimited amount of forgiveness. Which one is this, my money one? Who's got an unlimited amount of forgiveness for you and I? That's a king we could anticipate. That's a king we could look forward to. This king was promised to David in Samuel, 2 Samuel 7, 16, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever and it's established right here through King Jesus. We also need something more than power. Which one's my power one? This one? Good. We need hope. Hope. We need hope that, that, that God is all-powerful, that he does understand power and restraint, and that he knows what we need, and he can take care of things. He's the one that's in control. We are not designed to take control over the things of God, and we need his hope to do that. The hope of Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. This anticipation of King Jesus and instead of searching for all these other things in our life, is this the sex one? Good. Thank you, guys. Sorry. We need peace. Peace. We need peace in our life. To pursue peace. To pursue genuine, true relationships, not things that fade away. That's the kind of hope. That's what this king brings. That's what this King Jesus that we're anticipating, that's what he's bringing to the table. And it's prophesied that where he's going to come from and what it's going to look like in Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. This is in Micah 2. This is a, a, a forecasted, talked about king. And he is so worthy. So what does it mean to seek King Jesus? We're going to spend our time in the next four weeks going over uh, Matthew chapter 2. And we'll be uh, in verses 2 through uh, 12. So if you want to spend time in that in your reading, just get a rep in it every day when you're reading your text or something you can do. That'd be great. And so let's talk about this king and his arrival and so uh, we find this account in Matthew uh, cha chapter 2, verse 2, and it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, because he was forecast, for, uh, foretold that he would be born there, uh, in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, and they asked, where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. If you missed last, last year, we talked about uh, the Magi and who they were. But a Magi is like a governor and a scientist and, a, and an, a, 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 just an amazing person that, that they would be very well respected and well off. And for some reason, these Magi heard about this birth and they thought this was pretty important. Can you imagine something so important that you and I planned a two-month trip and take a look at this map? We planned a two-month trip to... We couldn't fly, we couldn't drive our cars, we couldn't uh, use our electric vehicles to get there. We had to walk and be with our donkeys and all those things. And we're going to bring gifts to honor this king. And so can you imagine your favorite governor, whoever that is, combined with your favorite scientist, combined with your favorite stock, uh, talk, uh, stockbroker person. I don't know if any of those people are your favorite. Just stopping everything that they're doing to go and seek and find this king. You imagine the intentionality that it would take. Verse 3, when King Herod heard 
This was, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's uh, chief priests and teachers of law, and he asked them, uh, hey, where is this Messiah who is to be born in Bethlehem in Judea? They replied, for this is, what, uh, this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. Out, uh, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi in secret, secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for this child. Seek out this child. Find this child. Search carefully for him. The only thing we could listen to Herod told that would be good for us. Seek him out. How are you going to seek him out this season? As soon as you find him, because Herod's so nice, report to me uh, so that I may go worship him too. Herod is the same crazy guy who killed his favorite wife, killed his sons, uh, because he's a uh, maniac leader. And he wants to go worship this king. I bet he does. He's the same crazy guy that ordered the killing and murdering of baby boys two years and under because he just wanted to see if he could clear the table and make sure that he got this king. Because guess what he was in charge of? He was in charge of the Jews in a sense. And this is his replacement. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And as uh, the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. How many of us would say that you're overjoyed with King Jesus? That you are wowed by him and how he moves in your life? That you're wowed by the peace that he can give you? You're wowed by hope, and you're wowed by his forgiveness. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. And they opened their treasures and prevented, uh, presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So as we enter into this Advent season, let me ask you a question. What are you going to do with this promised king? What is it going to look like this season? You know, seeking a king takes intentionality. Seeking, do you think it took intentionality for them to plan a two-month journey? Do you think there was danger in that journey when you're walking through the desert? Do you think they just brought him like, okay, and Jesus, you are, here you go, here's your gold. And uh, here's what's the next smallest block. Here's your frankincense and here's your myrrh. Is that how you would welcome a king? You should read about the gifts that Solomon got for his kingship. Metric tons of gold. Like they probably brought a lot of stuff for this king. They were wealthy. They probably had people that they had to hire to protect their stuff as they're dragging it across to, to, to seek this king. So seeking a king, it takes intentionality. Sometimes you got to reorder your life. Sometimes you got to get some stuff out of the way so you can see the king. And only you know what's in the way of how you're seeing Jesus right now. It takes planning. What is your plan to seek King Jesus this this year, this season? What could change? What could pivot in your life? What is obscuring your view of what it looks like to be with the king? How do we not get lost in his celebration? How do you not lose the most valuable gift God has given us as we celebrate him? You ever lost something that was really important to you? How many people are regular losers of stuff? Some of you are like, that's me. Okay, air tags are really cool. Um, But then you have to figure out how to log in to get those. What would be devastating what is something that would be absolutely devastating if you lost? Uh, let's talk about, let's be real shallow. Let's talk about uh, just tra- like possessions. What is your most prized possession? And I bet you for many of you, it's not the most expensive thing you have. It's probably something that has a lot of meaning that was given to you maybe by a family member, something that could not be replaced. 
I remember uh, one of the first uh, weeks we were in ministry, uh, Carrie and I in Montana, we went to a Baptist uh, Montana church conference. I can't remember if it was Great Falls or Helena, Montana. And it was nice and warm in, in, in that area in July or February. And uh, I remember us getting out of a, this beat-up church van we had driven over there to, and I can't remember if we were going to the conference or going to our hotel, and Carrie got out, and uh, her hands were, were cold, and she went to do some of the jacket and flung her wedding ring right into a fresh pile of snowbank. Like, that's something that's pretty valuable. And you know what? It didn't matter if we were late to something. It didn't matter how cold it was outside. It didn't matter, you know, how big the snowbank was. You know what was going to happen? We're finding that ring. We're finding that ring. Gloves, no gloves, bare hands, doesn't matter. Like, we could warm our hands up later when the ring's on it. And so I think about it, like, do you search for Jesus that way? Or does it kind of get, like, stale and old? Like, you're like, yeah, I got it. Oh, wrong side. My ring's right here. Sorry. This one's always with me. I will not lose it because um, it's tattooed on my body. Anyway, um, but like, yep, got it. I'm still married. But do I seek my marriage the way we should seek Jesus? Do I seek it the way as if I lost something that was really valuable? How hard would you look for something? How long would you look for someone Moms and dads, as you think about your kids, and some people in here have lost kids before, how long would you seek and look for them? And sometimes they're not even physically lost. Are you seeking your kids? Sometimes you just got to move stuff out of the way to see what you're looking for. What are, what are you looking for? Are we going to find the king? Three people after our second service are going to start their journey. They're going to start their journey. They're going to put a marker in the ground to be baptized, to say that, no, I'm here of my own free will. I want to follow this king. And so for all of us, that may start with a recommitment for you. Do you need to recommit to this king? So what does it look like to follow this king? Well, he gives us a guidebook. It's pretty cool. He gives us community to help us. But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that he died on the cross, then you will be with him in the kingdom of heaven. And so if that's you today, if you need to recommit, recommit. If you've never prayed that prayer today and you came in and it was weird because the presents were all over the stage, but you've never prayed that prayer or you don't think you really locked in and you understand what it looks like to seek the king, uh, after our service, I'll be around here. We'll have some of our other guys around here. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to help you walk through that. And maybe it's your day. Maybe you're going to be getting baptized today and you didn't even know it. But what does it look like to seek the king? What is it in your life? You have to answer this question. What are some, anything that you need to remove that are getting in the way of you worshiping King Jesus? Your life doesn't need to be consumed with the pursuit of money. Your life doesn't need to be consumed with the pursuit of power uh, in order to miss Jesus. Some of these things are just little things. But just a little more of this and a little more of that, and then all of a sudden we have this anxiety. If you're coming into this season with lots of anxiety, you're coming to it with the wrong idea of what it's about. If you're overwhelmed, let's take a look at why that is. Let's talk about it. Do you think God desires for you to be overwhelmed and stressed out and, and panicky? Don't miss out on his best. He's worth, he's worth worshiping. And don't just think about it for a season. Think about it for a lifetime. When you seek God, here's what he says. Proverbs eight seventeen. I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. You will find him. Deuteronomy 4.29, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. He's not like earthly fathers that would leave you. He wishes none of his children to be lost, not one. And he will come and knock on the door. 
Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. King Jesus wants you. Do you want him? We're going to take this opportunity to go to communion as we enter into our season. But we come to the table earnestly seeing what does it look like to walk with Jesus? What does it look like to... These aren't bad. I mean, there's nothing. I don't know if there's anything in them. That'd be really cool. But these aren't bad. But they're bad if they're in the way of me seeing Jesus. If this becomes the priority, if it becomes about all the things you have to do, and you don't worship Jesus, then what are we doing? So if you didn't get communion, we, we get, we, if you're new with us, we do communion every week at this church. It's not easy. It's not convenient. Uh, Kathy was telling me how, how the price of these have gone way up now, and it's hard to get them, and all of these other things. It doesn't matter. The focus at the end of every one of our church services is on Jesus the Christ, the king of all kings, the king who came and made it work out for all of us. And so as we continue to seek that, if you missed it, Dennis will get you some. You can raise your hand, or Ron will get you a communion, and uh, we'll take it all together. But as you come in, normally grab one if you want to. If you don't think you're ready to take communion today because you got some stuff that you want to have a right heart, you can take it with you. I don't have to be present when you do it. You can commune with God anytime you want. So the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, it is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's not forget King Jesus, let's remember him. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me, for when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are proclaiming something. You are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's proclaim him. Father, I thank you for this time. I ask, Lord, that your hand be upon everyone in here, that uh, the words that were said here, your word, Lord, that your Holy Spirit has just fallen upon people, and people know in their hearts, and they're going to, you've identified, Lord, if there's something in the way between them and their relationship with you. I ask you to give them the power and the strength to follow through on whatever you've identified for them, Lord, where they can not just make it a season, but a lifestyle of seeking you. Because when we seek you and we find you, we do have hope. When we seek you and when we find you, we do have peace. And Lord, when we seek you and we find you, we come to you needing forgiveness. So help us, Father, during this time. In Jesus' name, amen.